thank you very much for that, that kind introduction. It's an honor to be here. And in fact, uh, Jan Tinbergen is a hero of mine. And uh, two entire sections of my graduate uh, class are devoted to ideas that he developed, one about the race between education and technology and the other about uh, uh, assignment, w which workers work with which machines and so on. Uh, and it's also an honor, uh, I was invited by Egbert, uh, uh, who I've known for more than 20 years when we were both early in our career and he visited uh, MIT. And of course, my friends and collaborators include Anna Salamans, uh, Martin Hoss, uh, and, and Willen as well, although Willen Vanderberg. Uh, I hope I did that okay. So it's a pleasure. So I'm delighted to be here among friends. Uh, so I'm going to speak now about uh, shaping the future of work. So there is a pervasive concern that automation is rendering human labor superfluous. Uh, this is well articulated in a recent book by the economist Daniel Susskind. Uh, machines will not do everything in the future, but they will do more. And as they slowly but relentlessly take on more and more tasks, human beings will be forced to retreat to an ever-shrinking set of activities. And let me say, this is a sophisticated argument. Right? This is not the old lump of labor, there's only so much work to do. If machines do more, people do less. Just saying that people are losing comparative advantage in the task that they do. And uh, this, this idea has a long pedigree. Uh, the, the Nobel laureate Vasily Leontief said, uh, progressive introduction of new computerized, automated, and robotized equipment can be expected to reduce the role of labor, similar to the process by which the introduction of tractors and other machinery first reduced and then completely eliminated horses and other draft animals. And he was writing that in 1983. It's interesting that you know 42 years ago he was talking about robots. Uh, so um, that's the kind of the era we're in, the, the backdrop for this discussion. Yet we know after a century of automation, we're still hard at work. The uh, employment to population rate in most industrial economies has risen over the course of a century, largely because women have moved out of unpaid, very restrictive work into uh, the paid labor market where they can exercise their skills and their creativity. And so this raises the question, uh, why are there still so many jobs? And so I want to set the stage. I'm going to talk about three reasons, and I'm going to focus on the third. But first, let me set up the first two, which are ones that you're familiar with. So the first one is insatiability. We never get enough. So let me illustrate this point. This is a picture of the Caven family and all of their material possessions in California in 1985. So they agreed with this photographer to take everything out of their house and put it on display. And you can see, uh, you know, they have you know, acres and acres of books, they have uh, many bicycles, they have appliances, they have television sets, they have kids' toys, more than anyone could ever need. And yet this figure is almost 40 years old. If I were to make a new illustration, or I had a new photograph, you would find that people have twice as much stuff. Right? So as people get wealthier, their desires for consumption rises about one for one, or maybe a little bit faster. <laughs> uh, and the end result is that creates a lot of demand. So as people get wealthier, they don't stop consuming and say, oh, I'm sufficient, I'm done. People's perceived needs rise with their affluence. So that's one reason why we keep creating more work, because uh, we create more work for one another. A second reason is that often when we automate, we're actually creating better tools that complement us. We're not simply eliminating our tasks, although that also happens. So I think of, like, for example, medical diagnosis. Right? Medical diagnosis does things that doctors used to do more slowly, but it also enables them to, uh, to diagnose new diseases or disorders and then to treat them. Right? So diagnosis, it's true, it takes away something that was time-intensive and laborious, but then it allows greater specialization, allows doctors to focus on different things, and not just faster, but in more depth. Right? It increases the resolution. But it's not just doctors. You know, if you have a pneumatic nail gun, Right? You can install an entire roof in a day and probably install it in places where it would be difficult to do. That's augmenting. That tool, you wouldn't, a roofer, uh, people who are roofers didn't say, oh, God, I have this power tool, now I'm worthless. They said, oh, gee, now I can do more in a day. My time is more valuable. I'm more productive. Or if you're an architect, uh, having drafting tools allows you to quickly render and calculate and engineer a structure and that allows you to use more creativity to build things that weren't previously buildable because you didn't have the uh, capacity, the, ca the, the uh, computing capacity, to determine if you could make them stand up. Or if you're an educator, right? Uh, things like Khan Academy or online learning, they don't just take one teacher and replace many teachers because that person stands in front of a computer screen, right? It's actually a different skill. Educating online is a different skill, and people are learning it, right? It's making them more valuable. Or even if you're a trucker, 
having routing software allows you to always keep your truck full and to participate you know, or to compete with a big delivery service by being automated by routed correctly to wherever packages are waiting. Right? So it allows you to use your time more efficiently. So in all these ways, technology augments us, makes us better at what we do, and expands the set of things that we're capable of doing. And that brings me to the third point, which is new work. As we advance, we create novel demands for human specialization and expertise, things that did not previously exist. And that's the focus of my talk today, is on new work. How do we know? So in, uh, if we compare 2018 to 1940, um, the US labor, and this is data from the US labor force, the US labor force has about tripled in size, it's gone from about 50 million to 150 million. About two thirds of all the work done in 2018 is in jobs that did not exist in 1940, things that were, had not yet been invented. So if you compare, if we just count employment today in tasks that were present in 1940, it hasn't grown much. Most of the net growth of employment is new work. So you might say, well, what do I mean by new work? So let me give you some concrete examples. You go to the doctors. There's some timeless tasks. The doctor asks about your stress, your exercise, your alcohol, hits your knee with a hammer. There are some tasks that have now been automated. You check the, uh, a machine checks your blood oxygen. A computer considers drug interactions. But there are also new tasks. Uh, here are some jobs that were added to the US Census uh, by decade. A diagnostic radiologist, a pharmacist technician, a, a mammographer. Those are new specialties. They require additional schooling and training. They require additional valuable expertise. They didn't exist 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Or consider going to a fitness trainer. Uh, there's some timeless tasks, grunting and sweating, the agony and the ecstasy. There are new tasks, uh, sorry, tasks that are automated. So all the measurement stuff, timekeeping, heart rate, pace, the equipment adjustments, adjustment, resistance, weight, et cetera. But then new jobs, a sports psychologist in 2000, a sports nutritionist in 2018, or a certified therapeutic recreation specialist, whatever that is, right? Uh, new work. Or take a final example, marketing research, timeless tasks, Form a hypothesis, propose analysis, stare at the results, start again, right? You all know that. Uh, things that are, many, many things in research are now automated. Estimating models, testing significance, generating tables and figures. But there's new work. Applied statisticians, director of marketing research and analysis, a data visualization developer. Thoroughly modern idea. Broadly, now let me show you representative data. This shows all of US employment in 1940 to 2018 ordered from lowest paying to highest paying on average. So if you look at the blue bars, those are 1940, most of employment was in farming, mining, and production work. Look at the other set of bars that are red and green. Mo we actually have fewer jobs in farming and fewer jobs in production than we, in 2018 than we did in 1940, even though the size of the labor force has tripled. Um, we have a lot more work in professional, technical, managerial work, clerical and administrative work, and also personal service work and notice that most of the employment in those occupations is new work, not just more jobs, but new jobs, the type of jobs that didn't exist in 1940. Okay, so my talk until the intermission is about new work. Where does it come from? What is it made up of? And there are four messages from this talk. One is that technological innovations both augment and automate human labor. Both forces are happening simultaneously. You, you know, this would, in Jan Tingberg's term, this would be the race between automation and augmentation. Okay? Um, we can measure and distinguish these forces. Second, it's not just technology. That's not the only thing going on. Demand shifts, uh, for, demand forces and shapes where new work occurs. Negative demand shocks will discourage new work creation. Positive demand shocks will encourage new work creation. And when I say new work, I don't just mean more or less of the same thing. I mean, when there is a positive demand shift, we get new forms of work, new specialization. And when we have an inward demand shift, those, that process slows down. Um, so it matters not just whether we innovate, but how we innovate and where we innovate. When I say how, I mean, do we augment or do we automate? When I say where, which occupations do we automate? Which ones do we augment? That's gonna change the shape of labor demand over time, so I'll show you. And the final point I'll make, and I'll come back to this in the second half, um, the future of work is a work in progress. 
it is a mistake to think that our job in thinking about the future is to forecast what is going to happen because we determine what is going to happen. And so we make decisions about the future of work today. We collectively, we as institutions, we as government, we as universities, um, uh, we as individuals and corporations. The jobs we get depend in part on the investments we make and the institutions that turn productivity into prosperity. I should say my collaborators uh, on much of the new material about new work that's in this new talk are uh, Anna Solomons of Utrecht University and uh, Brian Segmiller, who is an MIT uh, Sloan student, and Anna's here uh, uh, today. Okay, so here's my rough agenda. So first I'm gonna talk about how do we measure new work. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about testing some hypotheses about new work that sort of show you that this framework is, is productive for understanding what's going on. Then uh, we'll have a Q&A and intermission, pause, uh, and then I'll talk in the second part about shaping the future of work. So first I wanna talk about measuring new work. So how do we measure new work? So the US Census Bureau uh, has every, uh, every decade uh, asked every American uh, a number of questions, you know, where do you live, what do you earn, how many kids do you have, and they also say, what do you do for a living, what's your, what's your job? And people just write that down. Uh, there's not, it's not a checkbox. Uh, or the, in earlier days when people were illiterate, the census enumerator would write it for them. And then people in Washington, D.C. who have to handle the census, they have to take those written instructions and they have to classify them to a number of categories, you know, three or four or five or six hundred big occupations. To do so, they create these coding volumes, these uh, alphabetical indes of indices of occupations uh, that often have 30 to 40,000 entries in each decade. And then they update them each decade uh, as they find new things that get written in. And so inadvertently, they create a kind of a historical record of the emergence of new titles. And I should say the idea for this, and, and uh, 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 it comes from Jeffrey Lin, uh, to, to use these data in this way, who's an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. So let me give you some examples of some new job titles, new job, not new job types that were added. So, you know, in 1940, automatic welding machine operator, textile chemist in 1960, a circuit board layout designer in 1990, an artificial intelligence specialist in 2000, or a pediatric vascular surgeon in 2018. Now you look at this list and you say, ah, I get it. New work is using new machines. It's people who make those machines, install those machines, integrate those machines, sell those machines, cart those machines away, and recycle them. Right? Now let me show you another set of occupations that were added in those same decades. Acrobatic dancers, pageant directors, mental health counselors, conference planners, so I'm here today, music part workers, sommeliers, and drama therapists. Now, I realize sommeliers in Europe you know, have been around you know, since before the printing press, but uh, in the United States, that's a new thing. Um, so what I, and what I want to illustrate is that many of, these new, of this new work is not just technology, right? It reflects uh, ch rising wealth, changing tastes, and even changing demographics that affects the demand for care work or the demand for uh, either elder care, child care, etc. So new work is much broader than simply technology. So that's how we measure new work, is by using 100 years of census coding volumes. Now I want to talk about how we measure technology. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, we're very proud of this figure. Uh, so how do you know that these titles are actually new? Right? I've given you a list, how do you, you know, that's what the census says, how do you know they're new? So what we do is we use, uh, we, we measure their occurrence in the English language, in English language text, using Google Ngram Viewer, which basically searches through uh, uh, everything that they have scanned from 1900 to present, and you can see, for the words that we see emerging each decade, you can see they, their peak usage is just approximately when the Census Bureau picks them up. So this is just a way of verifying that these things really do appear to be new, not just in the Census, but in what, uh, what is being written about in those time periods. So that's how we measure new work. So now I wanna talk about how we measure the technology side. So I wanna first, well, we, I wanna talk about augmentation and automation. So augmentation means adding value to worker tasks, making the work that people do somehow more productive or adding new components to it. The way we do this is we, again, use those historical census volumes. Don't feel like you need to read those texts, but that's a, basically a description of all the different things that health technologists and technicians produce, whether it's anesthesia or record keeping or uh, an audiometrist, someone who listens to, uh, someone who you know, checks your hearing. And so we think of these things as describing the outputs 
made by an occupation. And we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to use machine learning and natural language processing to find patents that mention those outputs. And we think when new innovations mention those outputs, they must be complementing or making more valuable or increasing the set of feasible tasks done by that occupation. That's augmentation. We also want to measure automation, innovations that substitute for worker tasks. The way we do that is, very, is in parallel. We use the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, this is a long-standing US volume, and it describes the tasks that people do within their jobs. This is their inputs, not the outputs, but the labor inputs. So, you know, performing medical laboratory tests, or um, conducting chemical analyses, or studying blood cells, or analyzing test results. And we look for patents, again, that mention that, that claim to do these tasks. And we think, well, if a patent says that this new innovation does this task that workers were doing, that's likely to be an automation technology. So we're measuring both of them simultaneously. I'll just say we have a procedure that, uh, that sorts through this information and looks for these linkages, and it's actually quite robust. Uh, we spend a lot of time refining it, and we always end up with the same answer. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's our, those are our two measures. And um, so let me just show you. This uh, shows you a, the relationship between automation exposure and augmentation exposure of occupations. So on the x-axis is how, so, how, how, much, how many automation patents are linked to an occupation. On the y-axis is how many augmentation patents are linked to a given occupation. Those are very positively correlated. Some occupations get a lot of both, right? So uh, if you are a, uh, a power plant operator, there's a lot of automation going on, but also a lot of augmentation. If you are a childcare worker, there's not a whole lot of either going on. But there are also, notice, occupations that are on the off diagonals. So for example, if you are a, uh, a cabinet maker and bench carpenter, um, there's a lot of automation going on in your occupation, but not very much augmentation as far as we can measure it. So we would tend to expect that occupation to contract because automation is eroding the set of tasks done by people. On the other hand, if you take something like mechanical engineers or operations researchers, there's some automation going on, but there appears to be a lot of augmentation, right? A lot of things that are complementing the outputs. And so we might expect that to grow, right? So we're going to be using these two metrics. So, um, so now I want to talk about, I'm going to test three hypotheses related to this, uh, to this measurement. First, I want to test that whether augmentation technologies spur the creation of new job types. I don't mean new workers, I mean new types of jobs. Then I want to ask whether when we see labor demand shifts, is it the case that inward shifts slow the emergence of new job types? And do outward shifts accelerate their emergence? I'll only test one side of that. And finally, I want to look at the relationship between new job types and employment. Right? So it's not enough that have people have new titles. We care about whether there is more work. And so I want to ask whether augmentation uh, predicts the growth of employment and whether automation predicts the contraction of employment. OK. So, this shows you a scatter plot of relationship between the emergence of new job types on the x-axis and the growth of employment uh, on the y-axis at the occupation level in the United States over the last 40 years. Right? So clearly there's a strong association. Where there are new types emerging, there seems to be new employment growing. But that's not enough. Where is that coming from? Where are those new job types coming from? Um, we shouldn't take them as you know, appearing by themselves. So we're going to try to look at their relationship to augmentation and innovation. So our first hypothesis is that we will see new job types emerging in occupations that are more exposed to these augmentation patterns. Right? So the outcome variable here is the growth rate of new titles, these new census occupations, uh, appearing in an occupation over each decade between 1940 and 2018. The explanatory variable is the flow of augmentation patterns. And so our prediction is that where augmentation patterns are expanding, we're going to see new titles emerging. So I'm going to show this to you with 12 pictures. Uh, uh, you can barely see them now, but uh, those correspond to those 12 occupations that I described earlier, from lowest paid to highest paid. I've organized them slightly differently here. So this shows you for blue-collar occupations. The blue line is between 1940-1980. The red line is 1980-2018. And this shows you on the x-axis the, um, the augmentation patterns and the y-axis, the emergence of new titles within detailed categories 
in, in whether we're talking about agriculture and mining, construction and mechanics, or production and operative occupations, there's a very strong association. Where we see new titles, sorry, new augmentation patents, we see new titles. That's also true if we look in professional and information occupations. It's also true if we look in personal services. It's also true if we look in commercial services. Wherever we look, uh, there's a very strong association where we see these augmentation innovations occurring, we see new titles emerging. Now, you might legitimately wonder, well, maybe that's just true for all patents. Maybe that's true for your automation patents as well. How do we know there's something special about augmentation? So that's a, uh, a good point. So we want to test that. Uh, so what we do is uh, we look at uh, both augmentation and automation. And this first bar shows you that roughly uh, if you have a 10% higher rate of automation exp augmentation exposure, we see about 1% to 2% faster growth rate of new titles appearing. When we do the same thing for automation, we see uh, no relationship. It's, it's negative, it's not significant. Those, those whiskers tell you that it encompasses zero, meaning we can't tell it apart from zero. And that's actually a pretty uh, uh, kind of an interesting result because as I showed you earlier, those two variables are highly correlated. Automation and augmentation are tending to occur in the same place, and yet only one of them is predictive of the emergence of new titles. The second test that I want to mention is, it's, as I emphasized earlier, it's not just technology, and it's a mistake and an easy one to fall into that thinks that everything's technology. Um, so I'm going to use another source of variation. Many of you may have heard of a country, uh, China, that has um, uh, grown a lot in recent decades, and uh, its growth uh, particularly its, its rise in comparative advantage in, in uh, manufacturing has had a large impact on U.S. manufacturing employment. And as China's uh, 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 prowess has risen in manufacturing, uh, U.S. manufacturing employment has fallen quite rapidly. And so this creates a negative demand shock to jobs that are potentially exposed to this China trade shock. And those are all over the place. You, of course, they're highest in production work, but you see some in construction work, in transportation, in clerical work, and so on. So we can ask, do our occupations that are more exposed to the China trade shock, do we see a slowing of the rate of new title emergence, of new tasks, of new job types? And our hypothesis here is that these negative demand shocks slow the emergence of new titles in an occupation. This shows you that relationship. This is the slowdown. So the positive bar means a slowdown. Where occupations that are seeing a larger contraction uh, in employment as a result of the China trade shock uh, are seeing a slowdown in the rate of emergence of new ta tasks, new types of work. Now, now, let me be clear. Yes, they are contracting in terms of number of jobs. They're absolutely getting smaller. But it's not just that. It's the number of new types of jobs that is also contracting, is slowing simultaneously. Now, you might say, oh, maybe these jobs, they're always, you know, jobs of the past, that's always happening. So we ask that question. We look at the same relationship for the prior 20 years when there was no China trade shock and at, look at these same occupations, and that is not occurring. There's, this slowdown only starts as the China trade shock uh, 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 arrives and accelerates. So there's an important point here uh, which is a distinction between more work and new work, right? And they, they tend to move in the same direction. But this says, you know, when we have this trade shock that was so, not, that, you know, caused such a large manufacturing contraction, it didn't just reduce the number of jobs, it reduced the number of types of opportunities that are available to workers. Conversely, when you invest, when you build out a sector, it's very likely not only will you create more work, but you'll create more new work, right? So if you're investing, if you're building your solar sector, right, you're not going to just get, you know, more solar installers, but you'll also get solar technicians and solar plumbers, right? If you invest in uh, semiconductor equipment, you will build specialization in those things. And that specialization is valuable. What makes human labor valuable is not the generic things that we can all do, but the specialized things that only some of us, you know, that we ch choose a comparative advantage and that makes our labor scarce. Um, the final point uh, is the relationship between uh, new work and employment, right? And you might say, legitimately wonder, all right, so you've shown me that augmentation creates these new titles and automation doesn't, but I don't care about titles, <laughs> right? I care about jobs, right? How does this relate to employment? 
And so uh, we're going to test that. We're going to ask whether occupations that are exposed to automation technologies see rising employment, and whether occupations that are exposed to automation technologies see falling employment. And I want to emphasize that this is actually a strenuous test because these two things are happening simultaneously, right? So we're asking if we can tell them apart, even though, and I don't mean just happening simultaneously, like in every period, I mean in the same occupations. We see both of these forces acting most of the time. So this shows you the answer to that question. On the left side is uh, the, the change in employment and occupation as a function of its exposure to augmentation patterns, holding automation constant. On the right-hand side is the change in employment and occupation as a function of its exposure to automation patterns holding uh, augmentation co uh, constant. And you can see that these are working in the opposite direction. This race between automation and augmentation is, you can see it in real time, happening in the same places. And so it is the case that although innovations are happening everywhere, and although they're highly correlated, they are working in different directions, they are distinct, and they have distinct relationships between creating new work and creating new specialization and creating net employment growth versus eroding, uh, eroding the, uh, the growth of employment and eroding the, uh, the, the uh, rate of new work creation. Okay, so let me summarize what was, I've said, and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, happy to answer questions. So um, first, new work is quantitatively important. We estimate that about 60% of employment in 2018 is in these new job types that didn't exist in 1940. Innovations predict where new job types emerge. New titles emerge where innovations complement labor's output, where they augment. Uh, new titles do not emerge where innovations um, replace labor's inputs. So both are going on. They have different relationships to employment. But innovation is only part of the new work story. New work is driven by changing tastes, by wealth, by demographics, by globalization. And its emergence accelerates with outward demand shifts. Where we invest, we don't just get more work, we get more types of work, more opportunities for specialization. And it slows with inward demand shifts. And so in net, these forces affect where new work emerges, which jobs shrink, and which jobs grow. And in the second half of the talk, I will talk somewhat about how we influence that process. But I'm going to pause here for now.